Hi, I'm Zach Childs, and welcome to the True Tone Lounge. Today, our guest is Daniel Tashin. Daniel Tashin recently worked with Casey Musgraves, and his work garnered CMA awards and Grammy awards, including the coveted Album of the Year award. That's correct. <laughs> How does it feel to walk away with, with that big of an award? Man, I'm still... I'm still sort of processing that, but um, you know, it's a it's a it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, no, no doubt. Are you getting getting a lot more calls? Well, you called me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course we did. So <clears throat> let, let's let's back up a little bit and uh, just uh, your your dad is uh, you know Barry Tashin. He had a group called The Remains. Right. They opened up, you know, for the Beatles in 66. I remember he wrote a book called Ticket to Ride. Right. I remember that came, that came out talking about that that tour. Uh, your mom's Holly. They uh, they toured together during the late during the 80s. Uh, your dad was part of the Amy Lou Harris's Hot Band. He replaced Ricky Skaggs. He was part yeah. of that thing. So. Tell me a, a little a little about growing up in, in that family and your dad, you know, touring with Emilu and things like that. Well, he toured with, with this guitar. Um, and, you know, he would play stuff like, um, you know, tic-tac kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, but this was his guitar. And when he bought it, he bought it in a pawn shop on uh, Nolensville Road, and it had a Rebel Flag pick guard on it. Uh -huh. uh, and he was like, I can't. Yeah, come out on stage with a rebel flag pickguard, but it just had a great sound to it. Uh, Japanese Squire, and uh, this was his guitar that he played. I saw him play this guitar on stage. You yeah, know, he needed a Telecaster, but uh, he had a great '50s Telecaster, but it was stolen. Um, there was a um, a theft in New York of a lot of uh, instruments having to do with the Amy Lou Harris uh, yeah. uh, organization. A lot of guitars got stolen, and his his '50s Tele got stolen. So, but it was a blonde Tele like this. With um, and so Fender made a new black pickguard for it. And um, and then you know when he left the Hot Band in the '90s, and I started uh, playing in like my high school funk band yeah. that I was in, I could play this guitar because he wasn't playing it. So yeah. I kind of just commandeered it, and a lot yeah. of my instruments I sort of commandeered yeah. from. From my dad yeah. or my mom, um, which um, you know they should have thought about that before they had me. <laughs> if they didn't want that, <laughs> they, they didn't want, want that happening. I guess your, your parents were, were mm. uh, I guess they were they were they had mm. made a record on Rounder and, mm. and they were turned doing kind of the acoustic thing and you and you and you you took the Telecaster. Yeah, and um, I mean among a lot of other things, I mean my first chorus pedal was a Boss CE two, I think, and. Um, and you know a delay pedal, a small stone phaser, uh, a tape echo. All these things were lying around uh, in my dad's little workshop. And yeah. you know, I mean, the first recordings I made were two cassette decks chained together, so you could record on one, then bounce to another one, then put that one back in the first one, and then add something else when you put it on the next tape. So, um, and you know, the edge. I mean, delay was what I really. I, I never knew what I wanted to, to sound like until I heard the edge. And and then um, somewhere in about '95, I got a Memory Man, mm -hmm. and that and that was really I didn't know that he was using the Korg SD300 or whatever it was, but I thought yeah. it was a Memory Man because it sounded like Edge to me. Well, he used one of those also in, the, in on the earlier records. He did, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, once I, you know, um, heard that sound, I was you know I think it was like uh, you could play it fairly easily too. You know, and I, I was like, "This is, this is going to be easy," <laughs> which I was incorrect. <laughs> uh, but that was my thought because, uh, you know, um, um, it takes a while to observe the subtlety of what somebody does. And Edge is an incredible uh, guitarist. That um, there's a lot of subtlety, and obviously tone, um, tone crafting, and um, incredible musicality, uh, and, incredible and ability. Effects usage, and it's always he's perfect. That guy does never plays. Well, I'm sure he plays a bad note sometime or another, but I've never heard it. Um, he's one of the most perfect guitar players uh, ever. Um, still using the same amp, and I like that he still uses, I think he's got an AC30, or maybe it's even a deluxe that um, he still uses, and if anything breaks on it, they just fix it. And yeah. He still uses it every night when Keep they going. play. So, um, I feel that way. I feel, I feel um, sort of sentimental about some of this stuff, you know, this was bought at a swap meet by my dad in California, uh, Ventura swap meet for $5 in <laughs> 1973. 
uh, and I feel, I, you know, it's been in the shop, and speakers have been changed out, and tubes changed out, and whatever. But yeah, it, obviously, it's been it's been recovered, and the and spirit got, of yeah. these things is intact. And and um, this is a fairly recent acquisition, but I do feel sentimental about it that it'll always be with me as long as I'm making sound. It's just got this kind of all the right mid range, enough top end if you need some. This is a 64. 64, room. yeah. You said you picked it up off uh, Tom Bukovac. Yeah, when he had the uh, second gear. Yeah, yeah, I went in there one day and I, I had a, I had collected a few synthesizers and I had I think I had sold some things in his st store, so I had six hundred dollars worth of credit, and then I brought in a couple synthesizers that I couldn't figure out, and uh, that's the thing I'm always getting in over my head with stuff and. And uh, I just plugged into that, you know, I said, is there any decent amps in here? He said, that one over there, and it looked like a dog. I mean, everything was all messed up about it. You can see the grills yeah. kind of busted here. But I plugged into it, and I thought, yeah, that'll work. So I traded in a couple things and had some store credit, and all of a sudden I got a pre-CBS uh, 64 Deluxe. The same year Mary Poppins was made, uh, and The Great Race came out, 1964. Um, it's the right kind of ragged, too. Yeah. yeah, it has a good has a good energy about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Seen some clubs. Yeah, has a good smell to it. If you, I don't know if you yeah. can smell it through the. There's a yeah, there's a certain smell to to blackface Fender amps or, mm -hmm. or or just you know these amps from this general. I don't know if it's the the wood or the glue or whatever that's in them. When they get hot, mm -hmm. they just kind of give off this this great smell that uh, you know that makes you you know think ah that's a you know it's an old Fender amp. That's the smell of a hot Fender amp. Also, something happens to the ions in the air when those tubes get going. I don't know what that does, but it's, tubes have a smell, too. Yeah. Mm, well, you know. I mean, yeah. if anyone would know you, you yeah. would know. <laughs> well, it's, it's a great smell. So, how were you impacted by, you know, like, like growing up in a, in a musical family and, and growing up, you know, you said earlier, you said like when you were seven and such, you were, you know, you were going and seeing your dad, you know, perform with the hot band with Emmy Lou. I mean, what? Well, it's pretty exhilarating, you know, Zach, thanks for asking that. You know, it's, um, it kind of gets in, if you're a certain person with a certain kind of curiosity and, um, you know, I wouldn't say you long for the spotlight, but you want to be a part of that magic. You know, if you're that kind of person, Boy, that stuff's pretty powerful, you know, when you're seeing that when you're a kid, you know. And I just took my daughter to see Casey at the, at the Ryman, and uh, I can see a similar sort of, um, you know, without trying to forecast too much about her, but see a similar sort of uh, curiosity and spark in her eye when she sees a performance like that, yeah. you know. And um, there's something about it. It's magic, you know. Uh, so... Like when you were watching Amy Lou, I mean, were you paying attention to her or the or your dad or yeah, like Frank Ricard or you everything? Know. You know, and yeah. tried. I was one of those kids that tried to put myself in adult shoes and think about whether I could um, sort of handle it. And I tended to overestimate my own abilities. Uh, you know, I got in some musical situations that were uh, a little bit. You know, I remember playing. I was about 22, playing drums on a session with like Michael Rhodes and. He was like, man, you know, there's some things about your plan that are exciting, but, you know, there's some other things that kind of need to get a little organized, need to get a little... And, uh, you know, um, everybody was really kind to me, but uh, I remember getting fired from a session because I hadn't really completely figured out how to play to a metronome yet. And sometimes you have to go, you know, you get the, the, um, the sort of uh, the wild enthusiasm of youth can cast you forward into situations where you're a little out of your depth with people that have been doing this a long time. And so it's taken me a long time to find my sound and to find a, an equilibrium and an understanding of, you know, where my strengths are, you know. What do you feel like your strengths are? Uh, well, um, uh, melody, um, um, lyrics, um, Rhythm. Um. So let's take like the the Casey Musgraves, you know, mm -hmm. record that you you know. Let's take a song like uh, like Slow Burn or mm -hmm. uh, or Lonely Weekend or something sure. like that. What would be you know, first those were both songs that you were a co-writer on. Right. It's like mm -hmm. so. What's the process there? So are y'all sitting in a room together? You know, for, yeah. for those writing mm -hmm. sessions. It's right and, out in the couch over here. Yeah. yeah. And you know you have acoustic guitars, you have keyboards. What do you, you know? What do you sure. have? Sure. 
Well, you know, you, yeah, you, you kind of get a little, it's very much like a seance, you know? You kind of um, you start to have a little strum and kind of if anybody's got some words that are bothering them or they, they've been floating around in their minds, they can put those out on the table. And, yeah. you know, you start to have a little strum around about an idea and you think about, you know, um, um, what, what, what would be a nice way to demonstrate those words or what kind of mu music those words would sound like, you know? Yeah. like. Uh, uh, and then you start to maybe make a little bit of a backdrop that someone like Casey could paint um, some of their some of their language and their ideas on, in a way that would sound good with that lyrical concept. And then and then you know you sort of you ask your heroes to look over your shoulder. You know you you, you know you think about the people that came before you and you know like this. This area it used to be very thick, and then you know a long time ago, Tin Pan Alley and 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 Strauss and and and. And uh, you know some of these early early cats. Uh, um, who's the old Kentucky home songwriter guy? Uh, you know these old old yeah. cats. Like they kind of went through with machetes and made a little bit of a path. And and then you know and then Carol King and some of these the women Brill started building. coming. Brill yeah. building people. They started coming down with um, you know maybe chainsaws. You know to make a little bit of a wider path. And then now it's like you can get a four wheeler down there because people have been here before and they've we've put these things together. And so there's a little bit of a, um, you know, these heroes of ours, Bob Dylan, Neil Young, they've opened the, they've opened the pathway up for, for, for this generation to, to take it to the next place. And we can carve our own paths and we can yeah. find our own trails. And, you know, but they, they the hero, you know, your heroes, they open the door for you. You know, The yeah. Edge, Daniel Lanois, Brian Eno, um, they, you know, um, very much indebted to those people. Yeah. So you said that they are kind of looking over your shoulder in a way. Mm -hmm. So... So are you actively thinking about like what they did or comparing your work to what they did to kind of, you know, be as kind of a litmus test for what you're writing? I don't think you can start with the bar that high. You got to start yeah. with the bar kind of low and be able to be kind of stupid and just think of it, say anything you think of or, you know, yeah. just kind of experiment. If you got to be amazing, it can, it can intimidate you. But I think more about my heroes when it comes to how you're going to think about something, you know. Um, Ryan Eno always talks about, you know, what kind of frame is it going to go in? Are we going to put this in a really clean, pristine frame? Are we going to put it in a dirty frame? Are we going to... Um, who is it for? You yeah. know, who's going to listen to this? It's more yeah. like when you think about your heroes, it's like... And I think about Lenoir, I think about yeah. the flesh of the fingers on the, on the yeah. strings, you know. Uh, and just... just the way that his, um, or that kind of, that kind of shimmery sound that he gets, you know? Yeah. You get a lot of control with your fingers because you can, and if you want a note to jump out, you know, you have a lot of control or if you're just jamming with a pick all the time, you know, that's the that's the other thing I think about Len Lenoir is like, you know, put the pick away a lot of the time. I mean, there's certain things you gotta have the pick for if you're trying to yeah. put an acoustic part sometimes or, 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 you know, a real specific thing, but the fingers is where it's at. So tell me on a, on a tune like Lonely Weekend where you, you know, played guitar, how, how did you think about those, you know, guitar parts or, or the other instruments that you played on that song? You know? Man, you know, I just, um, I mean, first of all, I just got to say, Todd Lombardo, that's one of the most, and Ian Fitchick, they are two of the most inspiring musicians I've ever come across. I mean, these guys, they really spend a lot of time with these instruments, and they really know what the hell they're doing. So in a lot of ways, um, I'm kind of watching and learning okay. um, uh, from those guys, because, um, you know, all the time that I've spent uh, thinking about lyrics and spent, you know, trying to think about melodies and all that kind of stuff, they they, they really, um, they're master musicians. And, I, you know, I'm... I'm I'm watching them, but you know, I have my own kind of um, chord shapes that I like, and my own kind of um, um, you know, if there's a capo around here, I can show you. And so, like a lot of times, you know, I'll just sit around and um, and come up with little little bits of music. Now, it's very um, a bit naughty to put a capo on an on an electric guitar, but I will do it. No, it's it's, um, it's perfectly legal. You know, and you know. Yeah.
just kind of sit around and try to find something that has a hypnotizing kind of circular feel to it, you know, yeah. and some of it too, you know, I start thinking about, I think about Mark Knopfler and I just think about the way that he like just kind of can get, sometimes, not always, sometimes his chords are angular, but the way yeah. that he can kind of cast a little bit of a, of a late night kind of spell and feeling to you, you yeah. know, and, and some of the reverb is, it can help with that, you yeah. know, and so I'll just make a little, in the computer, just a little bit of uh, a little bit of music that that maybe has a certain mood to it, and some of that has to do with just again the fingers and just sitting yeah. there and kind of finding those shapes. And I, I really like to work around those kind of shapes, you know. Um, it's impossible to keep a guitar in tune. <laughs> it is. It is. I'll tell you on that song, I, I really struggled um, because I had a line six pedal and there was a knob on the pedal that, if the tuner was on and then you turned one of these knobs, it would um, change the, the sense of the tuning. And so my tuner got set to 440, 48, just because the tuner was on and one of those little con, you know, yeah. uh, knobs, its designated function was to change the, like yeah. wh who would need it? That, that yeah. should be way more hidden than that. <laughs> it should be. You know, but anyway, it had gotten moved and I didn't notice it and I yeah. could not get my guitar in tune and it was just yeah. a bit, but I don't mean to be, you know, uh, laboring over the fact that I think maybe somebody tuned another guitar and gave it to me, but but um, yeah, I I feel for people who are you know songwriters and they're suddenly in these recording situations and um, you know there's a lot to think about. You got to think about um, well primarily tuning and like Todd knows you know certain things are just not going to be. I remember I was playing a chord and he was like that's just not going to be in tune in that key. And now I hear these things much better. So I wouldn't play an E like like that, I would yeah. play it like that. Because of the third, mm -hmm. you know, because that way you're, you're yeah. stacking fifths instead mm -hmm. of, yeah. Interesting, you, interesting that you said Mark Knopfler because, uh, you know, when, when I heard that song, I was like, you know, that, that, that guitar part has kind of a Knopfler quality and also there's kind of a James Taylor quality to the tune, also kind of a mm -hmm. Patty Griffin tune. And you worked with Patty Griffin also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, was, uh, that was way back in the 90s. It was the Flaming uh, Red album. That was one of the first sessions I did, yeah. Um, Jay Joyce, uh, another guitar hero of mine. I think about these people all the time. I think about, I think about their um, their energy, and I think about their, um, you know, their commitment and their love, their love for music, and their and their their commitment to making something that they would like, taking a situation and turning it into something that they would like. Yeah, you know. What are some things you know? Because Echo and the Bunny Men, you know, yeah, stuff like that. I mean. What are some things that you've gleaned from some of these guys you've worked you've worked with, like, like Jay Joyce or T Bone mm -hmm. Burnett, or what are some of the, some of the things that you've gleaned from them? Man, so many. I mean, um, I think Jay has a um, a wonderful touch and a wonderful um, instinct about what frequency um, a guitar could do something in that can be not interfering with the other things, but still. Um, you notice it, you notice it, but right. but it doesn't step on anything's toes, but it gives it this like kind of um, uh, space that I, I just, I love, I love his playing so much. And, and he's got these, these kind of hands that I have much more delicate hands than he has. Uh, but, um, but he's just amazing. And I also think Jay, um, I, th I think about Jay because I think about that he, um, he's, um, he's got a, uh, a bit of a, um, uh, a chip on his shoulder, and rightfully so. I mean, there's a lot of things you can sort of um, work up a little bit of a, you know, of a, uh, a lather about if you want to sit down and kind of get yourself kind of um, uh, a little, uh, have a little edge or a little anger about about your energy. And but I think that it can be helpful in music because um, you're not going to want to do anything like everybody else does it. And, and it's important to have that spirit of originality. And, and if you've heard a million songs where, I remember we were working on something and every song had the like breakdown last chorus and mm -hmm. you know, it was like the band would break down and he was like, we're not gonna break down on the last chorus because everybody else does. <laughs> and, uh, and I like that. I like that spirit of we're gonna find our own way, you know, because um, it, takes, it takes courage. Uh, to forge those new paths and those new sounds and to make your own way. And, I, and so I admire and respect uh, that man very much. He's very special to me. You know? Yeah. Uh, you talked about you know, frequency range, you know, like of the guitar mm -hmm. and have it where, where it speaks. Can you elaborate a bit yeah. on, on that? 
Yeah, just in that kind of range. Because it's staying out of the way of. Yeah, you're in a good spot if you're there, you know, when someone's yeah. singing. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you're playing in this cowboy chord area, you can't know, play it down there. Yeah. It just it just kind of ends up being part of the mud of mm -hmm. the vocal, the piano, and other other that's right. instruments. You so, know, I don't need to tell you. Yeah. But that's one of the things that's helpful about the capo. Sure. Yeah. And I saw Phoenix capo. at the Ryman, and they were they were playing. And that guy's a good guitar player, you know. And he was yeah. playing with a capo with a Telecaster. So I thought, well, yeah. if he can do it, it's a yeah. One of, one of our prior guests, I, I, I will admit to having a very uh, negative viewpoint on uh, the capo being used on yeah, electric Yeah, let's get guitar. it off of there. No, no, I, I, I love it. One, one of our, our past guests, John Leventhal, he, uh, mm. he used it I know a, a he bunch. does. I know he does. And I love so, him. And it, yeah, and it was just the way he used it. It was kind of like, okay, I've, I've been... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I love. I I've love. had a jaundiced view of this, and it's and it's inappropriate. The, the capo is a fantastic tool. For any but instrument. you don't find stuff if you use a capo. You don't gonna find like you know, like an open string might sound cool somewhere, but if you have a capo on, you won't. Yeah. You're not gonna find it because. But you can move it around by using the capo. You can do that in another key and get that same. Interesting voicing. I like those funny ghosty things, you know? Yeah. Something about house music, like if you listen to house music and you know, you don't really, you know, have like that much reason to listen to it, but somebody, you know, like Robert Hood or Derek May and stuff like that, where they get a keyboard where you press one note and it plays a chord, yeah. and then they just start playing kind of different random chords all over the place, they're like, yeah. they'll, they'll be like. Yeah. With, with a, you know, with a house music, and I, I, I like that because it sounds unusual, mm -hmm. you know, and, and if there's a repeating pattern, your brain will eventually notice it, and you'll be like, okay, I hear the pattern, and yeah. it's, a hard, it's an interval that's uncommon. Right. You know, and so I think about house music too, you know from a composition standpoint. Yeah. Like a guy like Robert Hood is, I mean. So does that, would that influence your work more with Casey or more your work, like I know you have a couple side projects, like you, you've got the, uh, the Silver Seas mm -hmm. and you've got uh, Skyline Motel. Yeah, probably more, maybe my own things, but um, I don't know. Once you start thinking about some of these concepts, they just bleed into everything, you know. You, 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 you just become like, uh, this kind of collage of all the things that you love and yeah. the things that you surround yourself with and the ideas and concepts that you surround yourself with, they work their way in. I mean, I, I you know, I use samplers um, and, and uh, on Casey's album and, and, and I don't know, my love for electronic music, it seems like it doesn't fit with someone who's sort of pretty much an analog person. I mean, I write things down, I write all my lyrics on a notebook, I you know I I have a date book, and so I don't like using the calendar and the phone. I like, I, I, yeah. I, but but I love electronic music, and I love um, the act of trying to get these machines to be um, to 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 sort of be reflective of the human spirit and the human soul, and the and the the potential that they hold. I I, um, I love machines. Yeah. yeah. The uh, the use of uh, I love pedals. I love to tell you about them too. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we will talk more about that in just a, in just mm -hmm. a moment. On the on the first off, how did you how did you end up getting called to work on, with Casey? Ian suggested that we write a song. Okay. Um, and I have a bit of a background in songwriting because I've been writing my own songs right. for a while. And so she, he suggested that the three of us should write a song, which we did. And I had. Uh, a little piece of music that I made in, in, on the iPad in an app called Gadget. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was just this circular pattern of chords that was like... Yeah. With a kind of a house beat. Like it sound, I was trying to make something that sounded like the Verve. And that turned into uh, a song called Oh What a World that she, yeah. um, you know. Um, so 
It's a bit luck, a bit of luck, but also, you know, I go to the beach um, with my in-laws and, and my children, and when I go, I just take my iPad and I'll just make little loops of different chords, and then yeah. when I get into a situation with somebody like that, you so, know, I got something yeah. to come in with. I'm not just like, well, what do you got? Yeah, <laughs> you've <laughs> you actually know? got some ideas. So you, uh, you, you write with her, and then w when does it come to the point of, uh, yeah, w will you co-produce? Well, what happened was we, I think we were, you know, we, we made a few, th a few songs out here. We wrote a few songs, and we, we had some tracks we made. And we thought, well, let's take our tracks, kind of our bones, and take them over. And um, Cheryl Crow had, uh, is a friend of my father-in-law, Jay Barron. Yeah. And she said, well, you know, I'm on the road a lot this summer. If, uh, if Daniel wants to come and mess around in my studio... She was extending that invitation to me, so I said, well, I'm going to take Casey and Ian over there. Yeah. So we went over there to Cheryl's place, and she's got an incredible studio. And um, we started taking some of the bones that we had started here over there and laying some, you know, um, things on top of them. And then we would be listening back with Craig Alvin, wonderful engineer, and Todd Lombardo on yeah. acoustic. And, you know, either Ian or I would play the bass or keyboards or whatever, guitars. Uh, and then we started listening back to some of the things that we were doing and we all looked at each other and it was sort of a group decision like, this sounds pretty good, we should do a record like this. So we kind of decided that way. Yeah. Also on Oh What a World and also on uh, Butterflies, there's, uh, I guess that's a vocoder effect that was used on the... Yeah, there were several different things to do that. The first one was done in Ableton Live. Um, and then we started using something called Antares Harmony Engine mm -hmm. uh, for some of the other ones. So two different yeah. things, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's you know neat on on, on butterflies on the on, I guess it's on the second time through the chorus where yeah. or the, the pre-chorus where you hear the uh, you know, coming you know the. It's a very crude in. thing that Antares Harmony Engine. It's sort of like I guess they made it for people who want to like have harmonies on their songs, but. They don't want to sing them. Yeah. So it's just like, I mean, the whole thing is bonkers, but uh, um, y you can, um, there's some things in there you can specify what chord it's going to be. So, you know, like if you're on. I'm still holding me down. Uh, I'm still stealing my crown. I'm tangled on the road and we're tired. You can specify like a major seventh chord, even though that chord's not in there. If the right. harmonies are doing that, yeah, it sounds cool. Yeah, you know, even though that chord's not really in there, yeah. it is in the vocoder s stuff. Talk a little bit about uh, your, uh, you know, you have the uh, the Silver Seas, and you also have Skyline Motel. Uh, Skyline Motel is with some other, you know, fellow songwriters, uh, Sarah Buxton, Kate York. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Has that been, uh, I see that y'all actually played a, a show recently. Yeah, you, you I mean. You have played off and on. Yeah. It's nice to be with friends and make music, and it makes it, um, you know, it makes the time go by quickly, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's a joy to, to, to get to make music with friends. And those are some of my closest friends, Sarah and Kate and Ian and, and Tom and, and um, you know, uh, the wonderful Rich uh, Brinsfield on the bass. Um, uh, so it is, it's a joy to make music with them, and we don't work very often, but we seem to get a lot done when we do. And the funny thing about that band is we don't really remember writing our songs because we just kind of write them and then that's what they are, you know. And uh, you know, Somebody was asking me who came up with what on some of those songs, and honestly, I couldn't tell you because we just sort of, it happens fairly quickly. Yeah. But we don't work very often, but when we do, it's a joy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk more about sounds. Yeah, so, let's do it. Yeah. So you're, you seem to be, you know, kind of like the Edge and Lanois. You seem to be a guy that's that's inspired by by sounds. Oh yeah. Soundscapes, kind of, you know. Why don't you? Uh... I really like um, those mysterious chords, you know. Yeah. What makes them mysterious? They're sort of major and sort of have a, they sort of have a major energy yeah. and a minor energy and some suspension. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean we could look at it from a from a you know a, a circle of fists perspective about things and, and yeah. the circle of fists is important, but we could also just you know look at it from you know it's almost like colors. Like everybody has colors that they naturally gravitate towards. Yeah. You know, um, I, I gravitate towards navy. I don't know why yeah. navy and white. I don't it know looks, why. It looks very nice on you. I like seafaring themes, uh, you know, yeah. I like to have a look like I just, you know, came in from the morning, uh, you know, run. 
the morning salmon run. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, but that's what it's like, and I like reverb a lot. I like reverb yeah. a lot. Um, it, it makes me feel like I'm, you know, a lone Scottish piper staring out at the moors, you know, you know. And think about a mournful melody and a hymn-like kind of melody. Uh, reverb gives me the space to let the notes go for a second. So, Everybody has their own thing, and mine happens to be kind of right now where I'm at, Robin Guthrie, that guy is way up here. I don't know if you know yeah. his stuff at all, yeah. but he's way up here for me. And, and what he is able to do with the direct guitar, I'm just kind of starting to explore recording mm -hmm. guitars direct, but unbelievable. Um, he, I've read that he cranks it wide open and then plays quite gently, which is kind of where everything's sort of going for me in a way too, you know. Yeah. So if I'm gonna compose something, I've got a chord there, but I don't know what it is. Yeah. And I'm just gonna start to put in some bass notes. What does that sound like? I like to start with an open chord. Um, and I, you know, reverb's very helpful when you're composing because it can make you sound bigger than you are. And then there's this funny thing, this dream sequence. Now, sometimes I like to get um, a little bit of um, of a of something going with this thing, and it's an arpeggiator for guitar. Okay. So you could take something like um, one of these open chords. I'll mess with the blend. 
Sounds to me like maybe the bass is... between B flat. So, you know, then you got a little bit of something you could paint something across, you yeah. know, um, a melody or something like that, you know. So let, let's talk about uh, some of these boxes that you've got here. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, see. the best thing to do is take them one at a time. So, yeah, um, the Gravitas, for instance, it, it's an unusual tremolo pedal, um, and um, this is, you know, something that. Uh, my buddy uh, Joel came up with. I, I leave it on a lot of the time, and it just gives a nice little. I don't know if you can hear. Yeah, it's it's subtle. Yeah. It's subtle. Yeah. A lot of these boxes are actually kind of subtle, but you can also. Yeah. There's a little bit of rhythmic. It's almost acting like a, a volume pedal. Yeah. Um, so you can get some sort of steel-like kind of, um, but I usually just kind of leave it. Uh, and then, um, so that's the Gravitas. Um, the tonal recall is pretty interesting. Um, it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful delay. Uh, it, it it has a wonderful um, soft focus quality to the echoes um, that you really can't find. I've never heard in any other pedal. But just to give you an example of that, I'll turn everything else off. You hear that wonderful kind of. Now, if you hold this, now it's the other one. Now we're going to introduce a little bit of. Modulation. And it's this wonderful watery sound. Yeah. Now, um, like that just sounds incredible to me. Recall a little bit of it. I mean, it does a lot of stuff, but uh, I'm yeah. just kind of getting to know these boxes. But you know, like the the warped vinyl. Yeah, the warped kind vinyl. Of a vibrato thing. <clears throat> it's wonderful too. I'll turn that on. Yeah. Um, it's subtle right now, but yeah. it's wonderful. Uh, just gives enough of a shake to it to make it interesting.
Um, it can be pretty dramatic if you want it to be. I mean. Turn the warp up here. It just feels very emotional to me that 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 sound, you know. Uh, it, it it it's not cheesy, but it's like it 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 just puts a little bit more of uh, emotion to the sound to me. Does that does that make sense to you? Yeah. I leave that on a lot too, yeah. you know. I'll just it'll just subtly. Yeah. When the sound inspires you, you're going to be more creative. Like that to me in a track will sound way better than if it's just, I mean, it's still a nice chord. But when yeah. it has that little bit of motion to it, yeah. it's just it's just fantastic that way. Yeah. Uh, so the that's the warp vinyl. This is a nice pedal, the uh, the womb tone and the womb tone. Um, what in the world does that do? It gives you a little phase, it's a phaser, um, okay. and you know, so, it, uh, like if you're gonna make a shimmering like rhythm part, you know, like a... Again, it's kind of subtle, but... Yeah. It's, so, so that's nice. Sometimes, if I've got a groove happening, a band is playing, and I and I just want to put something in there that's just going to be, you know, that that brushing kind of thing like that. Yeah. I'll put that on there, and that'll give it a nice like, um, you know, it's still imp impossible to be in tune for me, but you know, I have to do it about thirty times, and then you can get it in tune. Especially if you got more than three notes. Um, so yeah, the womb tone. The Cali 76 is interesting. I love Ni Nile Rodgers, and I got the real basic version of it. They make one that's got a lot more knobs, but you know, if you... Yeah, the, the squashed, compressed, kind of direct sound. You know, and it brings out the reverb. I did lose a little gain though. Let me see. You can really hear the yeah. spring. Yeah. So yeah, you can get, that. it, it kind of helps you get funky. And then this thing's interesting. Overdrive unit? Yeah. If you want to add. Again, it's it's not like over the top, you know? No. It's pretty subtle. I think you could probably get it to go over the top. Yeah, but no, that's a nice drive sound. You know? Uh yeah. It gets you a little saturation if you need that, if you need some sustain. But it also has a nice clean boost. You just need a 
little more. It has two channels, so you've got an A and a B slot, and you mm -hmm. can uh, choose which order they're in and some other things, too. But um... So if you want to kick it on for a solo but still be clean... Big Sky is a pretty, uh, pretty well-known uh, reverb unit. Yeah, and and um, I, I, I love everything about it. And I've got a friend who's way more deep into it than I am. I'm still sort of exploring, but um, I love reverb. So I mean, naturally. That's a great chord to me. Yeah, that is. It can give you, you know, everything from a subtler, this is a nice setting. A little too much re on the mix, but. in this I don't know about you man but reverb I feel like helps me write songs you know like I just it connects I connects the hear, notes more I can just hear where where it's like I'm in this space already and then this is this wonderful pedal called the poly moon but I had to take my little label maker here and and write what all the different things do because they don't really tell you this is a Maris pedal and they're a very good um, company but they don't explain very much I think they like the mystery of you don't know exactly what it does yeah. but I kind of like to know what the switches do and I'm still learning uh, some of these things but um, so what do you use it um, for it, it is another one of those ones that gives you that real um, it's a wonderful delay but it, you, you can smear so if we listen to it now You'll hear the delay, um, but if I, um, you can multiply the delay so you get these funny bouncing things like. Okay. Yeah, like the multi-tap multi cascading delay. And then you can also, let's turn the mix up so we can hear it a little better, but. It creates yeah. patterns. Yeah. And it takes a second to figure out what they are, but here's another one. It's all always related to the... But you can also smear the um, delays so they become more like a reverb sound. So here I'll smear them now. There's no reverb on, yeah. except for the amp reverb. Would you ta would you turn that off on the sure. pe pedal there? Yeah. So it's almost got some reverb qualities, which again. So that's the poly moon, but it can get really dreamy when you you know. So we'll turn the dimension down. We'll turn the multiply down and turn the dimension up. Turn the mix up.
That's a lovely pedal, the Maris Polymoon. Um, we were talking a bit uh, before about, uh, you know, kind of... Some of those getting, inspirational things? Yeah, getting your, yeah, inspiration, and also like getting, getting your sound and, and just the, the struggle of, of getting your sound. Well, I think all these things are complex and they all take time and you have to sit with each box and you really have to just focus on that one thing for a second and try to understand it. And it's a process that's ongoing for me. Um, and um, these, are, these are really serious tools if you want to make, you know, they're capable of um, incredible things. Like they probably have some of these things more processing inside of these than they had on, you know, Apollo 13 for, to, to go slingshot around the moon and come back. You know, yeah. they got more computer processing in this, in this delay pedal than they had in there. Um, so, you know, you got to respect these things and um, give them um, the respect and space and time that they, that they deserve to be understood. Now, all these Chase Bliss things have some ramping qualities that um, there's some switches on the back of them mm -hmm. that you can um, use an expression pedal to um, control other parameters. Um, and they also have MIDI functionality that I want to get involved in, but right now I'm still enjoying setting my own tempos and kind of having a little bit of... Yeah. Um, just a little bit of analogness to, to, to yeah. what I do with the guitar. But um, I think I would say that, um, y you know, it's taken me a long time to find my sound. And, and I feel like I'm still exploring and still discovering and I'm still um, chasing uh, something. A lot of it has to do with somebody will say something. Luther, Luther Dickinson was over here the other day and he was like, I'm trying to not squeak the strings whenever I change chords. And so then this becomes this thing that you think about. Mm -hmm. You hadn't thought about it before as much, you know, but uh, it's improper sustain if, you, if you're squeaking the strings too much. But then it also kind of makes it sound like indie rock when you squeak the strings because you sort of know that. And I think this came out of the fact that his wife, Nisha, it hurts her teeth when he squeaks on the strings, so he's trying to just sort of avoid hurting her teeth. Mm -hmm. And so it sets in motion this way of guitar playing that, you know, you're trying to uh, do this thing that... And then you think about that for a while, and then you try to move from chord to chord without squeaking, and then, and then, then it's something else. Somebody else will say something else, you know. Um, you're trying to understand tuning. These things take a long time, and I'm just at the beginning. I'm 44 years old, and I feel like I've just been having some opportunities lately where I can make some music with some of these people like Ian that are that are just incredible musicians. And, and um, I would say if you're a young, younger person and you're, you're trying to find your sound but you haven't found it yet, don't get discouraged because it takes a long time and um, you, need, you need time and the right equipment um, to intersect together. You need to have that time and the, and, the, and the right equipment. And it doesn't have to be a lot of equipment. It could be one, for me, the memory man was one thing you know, um, and um, just that one box really helped me um, uh, get, get moving forward. Uh, I don't happen to have one right now, but I would like to have one again. Um, and um, I would say not to get discouraged if you're 25, if you're 30, if you're 35, if you're 40, and you feel like you're still struggling to find your sound and your tone. Um, sometimes it takes a long time. Um, and there's a lot of confusion nowadays, and a lot of people are are telling you that you know their box uh, is what you need, and it's very hard to uh, not be um, sort of seduced by the idea of a box that can do a lot of things. Um, but sometimes it's nice to have things divided out to where each box does one specific thing, and you can understand it that way. Um, was there anything else we were talking about with regard to inspiration uh, in that way? I think that. You know that yeah. you, know, you were you were hitting upon that that you know it it takes it takes time to kind of find your sound and also, you know, find the the right uh, equipment and mm -hmm. and it's not always, you know, doesn't have to be crazy expensive. You know, you're you're relying on a you know Japanese made Squire Tele, which is a great instrument, but it's mm -hmm. not you know, you're not saying you have to have a uh, you know ten thousand dollars. Yeah, that's a two hundred dollar you know. guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, you know. Um, I don't know, I would just say that um, you, every person has a, that sense within themselves of what they like, and it's like the colors that you wear, or the, um, and, and I just happen to like uh, the sounds that I like, and, 
but you know somebody else might listen to Zach Wild or 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 uh, you know Randy Rhodes, and that just brings yeah. this incredible spark of joy to their to their heart, and and that and you just have to follow that joy, you know. And that's your signpost of where you want to yeah. go. But I remember the first time I heard, you know, um, Eno's music for airports, I thought, I don't know what that is, but that's good to me. That sounds good. And then I would look at records and see, oh, well, Eno is working with you too. So there's some kind of something in there that's speaking to me. So I heard, I heard somebody say that uh, people's personality really comes out in their music in the way they play. Mm. You feel that's true? <laughs> Yeah, because um, you're thinking about singing when you're playing, you know, you're thinking, you're, it's a voice, you know, um, and um, certain singers are qu quite loud, uh, other singers are a little quieter. Um, I like quiet singers, I, I sort of like loud singers, I mean, I can think of loud singers that I like, Elvis Costello is loud, um, but I think the greatest singers are the great communicators like Sinatra, um, that... Um, really get the lyric across. When, were we talking about singers? Yeah. Or did I just take us no, you, that's, towards that's singers? That's great. That's great. But um, I think it's a struggle, and it's been, a, it's been a long road and a struggle for me, even though I've had advantages that a lot of people don't have with having parents with instruments around that I could try, mm -hmm. and it's still been a struggle for me. And I consider myself to be, you know a decent amount of talent, but I'm also kind of a slow learner. And in order for me to learn something, I have a terrible sense of direction. I have to go home before I go anywhere because that's how I know how to get everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, even with somebody who is a fast learner, um, and I think YouTube now, we didn't have YouTube when I was a kid, but you can get a lot of information that we, we didn't have access to. So I think you can progress maybe a little quicker, but you know, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to keep guitars in tune. It's a struggle to understand you can't play in certain keys and certain voicings without it being out of tune. It's a struggle to get your ear to where you can even hear tuning in a way that, you know, you know something sounds not good about what you're doing, but I spent so long like playing out of tune. I listen to my old demos and everything's out of tune. It's just, it's just terrible. It's just impossible. Every guitar is awful. Yeah. And every guitar is going to try to get you to play out of tune, and it's only through like just really a lucky sort of bounce that you can get all the notes to be in tune together. Because there's six of them <laughs> if you're playing them all, and you can't ever play them all. You should you should never play them all at the same time. Usually, I mean, I yeah. don't know. I really appreciate you letting us uh, in invade your studio. I'm glad to and, have you over, <laughs> and thanks for for talking about you know what. What inspires you, and uh, and and just your your musical journey, and uh, congratulations on the Grammy. I hope people will, if you haven't heard the latest uh, Casey Musgraves record, you need to check it out. Also check out the Silver Seas and uh, Skyline Motel. Thank you, Daniel.
Thanks for watching the True Tone Lounge. Make sure and subscribe so you never miss an episode.